Um, today, we're, we're, yesterday we had Matt Jackson, who's an economist, and today in the spirit of, um, of the diversity of the organization, we have a sociologist speaking, um, um, Duncan Watts. He, he told me actually, he's an expert organization, he actually taught theory of organizations, including work by Coase, North, Williamson, and Gibbons in, in, in the sociology department at Columbia when he was here. He's currently a uh, principal researcher at Microsoft uh, Research in, at the New York City Lab, and the A.D. White Professor at Large at Cornell. And prior, uh, prior to joining uh, Microsoft in 2012, he was from 2000 to 2007 Professor of Sociology at Columbia. And then a Principal Research Scientist at Yahoo, where he directed the Human Social Dynamics uh, Group. His research on social networks and collected dynamics has appeared in a wide range of journals. He was awarded the 2009 German Physical Society Young Scientist Award for Socio and Ecophysics, whatever that is. <laughs> 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 the 2013 Lagrange CRT Foundation Prize for Complexity Science, whatever that is, <laughs> and the 2004 Everett Rogers Prize. He's widely published. He has about 73,000 citations on Google Scholar and his books. And he said he basically encouraged all of you to go over to the bookstore right afterwards and purchase one of Small Worlds, The Dynamics of Networks Between Order and Randomness. Six Degrees, The Science of a Connected Age, and everything is obvious once you know the answer. So I think it's extremely <laughs> impressive for such a young scholar to not only be a well, well published, but also to write so many interesting and important books. And as I said, he, he, he would encourage, he would appreciate more sales. <laughs> <laughs> Today he will discuss computational social science, exciting progress and future challenges. And this is an important area for understanding institutions and organizations in the modern world. Please welcome Duncan Watts. Thank you. Anyway, it's great to be here. Thank you for making it out on a Saturday morning. Um, so I, I want to talk uh, about uh, computational social science, and I'll try to explain what I mean by that. But first, uh, I, I want to start by saying what I think is interesting about social science, and you know, I, I started off life as a as a physicist, and my PhD is in engineering, and so I, I kind of came to sociology rather late uh, in my career, uh, and uh, so this is just sort of a very personal perspective on on what I think of as interesting about the social sciences, and uh, the way I think of it is that you know, in the social sciences, we uh, we are essentially interested in collective phenomena. We we talk about things like families and firms and, and markets and political parties as if they are actors that are, that that have intentions and beliefs and 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 make decisions and so on. Uh, but of course, we know that that's really a convenient fiction. That that really uh, all of these uh, actors are. Uh, are agglomerations of individual people uh, who are the ones who actually have the beliefs and intentions and, and, and make decisions and so on. Uh, and somehow uh, these people are interacting with each other in complicated ways and producing these emergent phenomena that we refer to uh, in, in social science. And so this is a problem that in sociology is called the micro-macro problem and uh, in other parts of science is called emergence uh, where we are interested in this, in this um, uh, this mysterious process about how we go from the level of individual people uh, up to uh, social actors and forces. Uh, and of course this is a, a, a very difficult problem uh, from an empirical point of view. Uh, and so, you know, sociologists have been talking about this for, you know, at least a hundred years, uh, but we haven't made a tremendous amount of progress uh, in this area. Uh, largely, I think, because of the empirical challenges. And you've just, it's very easy to see why this might be problematic if you think about uh, you know, a social network of millions of people, uh, the amount of data that you would have to collect just to observe who is talking to whom uh, about what uh, over uh, an extended period of time is enormous. Uh, and if you care about uh, cause and effect, you may also want to run some sort of experiment, and doing experiments at that scale is, is even more difficult and, and, and often impossible. Uh, so uh, if you think about, you know, just in very basic terms, the scientific method where you, you propose your hypothesis and then you devise an experiment to test your hypothesis, if you sort of can't do the second part of the scientific method, uh, it's very difficult to make uh, progress. And so, you know, especially in sociology, but I think probably it's also true uh, in economics, we have lots and lots of theories about uh, how the world might work, and we are relatively, uh, we have a great deal of difficulty in deciding among these theories or, or rejecting them. Um, and so what is so exciting 
for me and, and, and my colleagues working in this field uh, is that over the last couple of decades, we're starting to see the, the sort of uh, some of these historical constraints lift, that for the first time uh, really in history, uh, we are able to, uh, to generate uh, data that is, is sort of at least uh, on the uh, scale and granularity of the phenomenon that we are, that we are theorizing about. Uh, and so uh, everybody talks about uh, you know, big data these days, and I think you know, mostly when they're talking about big data, what they mean is all of this data that's been generated uh, often by uh, commercial companies like the place uh, that, I, that I work at uh, now, Microsoft, uh, where you know, millions or hundreds of millions or possibly even billions of people are uh, searching for things, they are sending emails to each other, they are interacting via social media, they are purchasing things via e-commerce sites, uh, they are increasingly talking to uh, bots uh, and AI uh, agents. Um, and in the course of going about these everyday activities, they're generating an enormous amount of digital data that uh, people like me can sift through uh, afterwards to try to uh, answer questions that are of interest to social scientists. Um, a, a lesser remarked upon, but I think also very important uh, element of what's been happening over the last couple of decades is that the web is also transforming our ability to do experiments. Uh, and some of those experiments are, are much like the traditional uh, psychology or, or, or more recently behavioral economics experiments that have been conducted in labs and universities like this one for, for decades. Uh, and some of them are more like field experiments um, uh, uh, that are where you have some sort of randomized treatment applied uh, in the wild. And so I think if you Kind of put all of these things together, uh, you get uh, what I would refer to as uh, computational social science, this sort of emerging intersection of the social sciences and uh, the computational sciences that is becoming increasingly popular. Uh, so that's sort of, you know, very roughly what I mean by uh, computational social science, and I'll, I'll try to illustrate that uh, throughout the rest of the talk just really by examples. Uh, and I want to focus on two types of examples. Uh, one is more of the big data uh, sort, where we have data from somewhere, and then we try to make sense of it and, and use it to, uh, to evaluate theories that we have, in this case, about social contagion. And then the second uh, type of data that I want to talk about is, is what you might think of as small data, uh, where you are designing some experiment in a lab uh, and, you're, uh, and, and you're trying to, uh, to identify cause and effect. And in that case, you're, you're really sort of not dealing with billions of people, you're dealing with maybe dozens of people, so the numbers themselves are not large, but there are other advantages that we get uh, from this virtual setting. And so I want to uh, emphasize that the questions here, and this is really where the social science part of computational social science is important, these questions are not new questions. There's nothing, I mean, everything I'm talking about today is old, uh, you know, decades old in some cases, centuries old. Um, but because we have these new sources of data, we're able to, uh, to ask these questions in different ways or push them uh, in different directions uh, and generate new insights. Uh, I think also it's important to be you know, realistic about what we're capable of doing and uh, there are lots and lots of problems and there are lots of limitations of, and you know, there are things that we can imagine doing that we can't do and things that we haven't even yet imagined doing. Uh, and so if I, if, I, if I have time, and I may, I may usually run out of time, but um, I'll, I'll try to get at the end to sort of talking about some of the, the uh, ideas, thoughts for kind of where we might go from now. Um, and finally, I'll just say, uh, you know, this is very much an overview talk. I'll be presenting a bunch of different papers and uh, uh, so I will not be going into details. I will be skipping lots of details. So if you're the sort of person who gets really frustrated when the speaker is skipping over details, um, you know, please, uh, you know, bear with me. All of this is published stuff. I can share the papers with you. Uh, happy to talk about it afterwards. Um, but I apologize in advance for skimming over um, potentially important details. Okay, so let's start uh, with this question of social contagion. I'm, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with at least some of this literature, which is pervasive, uh, both in economics and sociology and also in marketing, um, and you know, these days in, in computer science and physics as well. 
Uh, and we have you know, hundreds of, mo well, dozens of models uh, of, of, of how things spread uh, um, uh, between people, ideas, behaviors, so on. Um, and many, if not all, of these models can trace their origins to uh, earlier mathematical models of uh, infectious diseases, how biological diseases spread among humans. Uh, and so uh, what I would posit to you is that when we think about, the, you know, we sort of abstract away from the details of these models for a moment, uh, and what's driving a lot of them is this mental model of, of how things are spreading in some uh, typically unobserved human population. Uh, and in the cases of uh, mathematical epidemiology, this is exactly uh, the model that is being formalized, where you have some uh, individual who is um, initially infected, and in this case, so imagine you know, the Ebola virus starting in West Africa a couple of years ago. It was literally the case that a single person gets infected uh, with Ebola from uh, some animal reservoir, and then that person uh, infects uh, a small number of, of probably his uh, uh, family members or, or immediate neighbors, and then each one of those people infects a few people, and each one of those people infects a few people. And over time, you see this uh, branching process grow exponentially uh, to infect uh, a very large number of people over many, many generations of, of the disease. And so this is the this sort of multi-step peer-to-peer branching process is uh, very much what is represented in formal mathematical models of, of, of disease spreading and, and, and also social contagion and, and, and also the kind of mental model that we have when we talk about things going viral on the internet. We have this notion of, you know, uh, of information spreading through social networks in this, uh, this multi-generational uh, way. The problem with that mental model is that historically the data that we have had doesn't look anything like that, right? So when we look at these sort of classic works of diffusion, so this is Everett Rogers' uh, book, Diffusion of Innovations, which is one of the most cited books in all of social science, uh, and then uh, the Coleman, Katz, and Menzel uh, work from Columbia actually back in the 1950s looking at the diffusion of, of tetracycline among doctors in the, in the Midwest, what you, what you see is uh, on the x-axis is time and on the y-axis is some cumulative number of, of adoptions over a whole population. Right? So, uh, so this, is, uh, this is the type of data that people who study innovations have typically had over the years. Uh, and the claim is that if you see something that looks like this S-shaped curve, you can, uh, you can identify that there is some diffusion process or contagion process at work. And so the idea here is that, you know, sure enough, here's this sort of initially infected person, and then as they infect a few people, it grows slowly, and then as it, uh, it, it then kicks into this exponential growth phase and eventually asymptotes as it runs out of people to infect. So that's the claim. But there are some problems with evaluating uh, contagion using these aggregate S-shaped curves. Uh, the first one is that there are lots of ways to generate S-shaped curves. It's not only the case that many of these models generate S-shaped curves, and so it doesn't really help you very much to, uh, to disambiguate between models, but there are, there are other processes that involve no contagion at all that can also generate S-shaped curves. So just uh, assuming some sort of uh, heterogeneity and propensity to adopt across the population can generate an S-shaped curve. Once you uh, allow for marketing efforts, and almost everything social uh, has some sort of marketing or media uh, uh, component to it, uh, then uh, you can also generate S-shaped curves. So it's very hard to, you know, just because you, your model generates an S-shaped curve and your data is S-shaped doesn't mean that your model has generated your data. Uh, the second problem is that uh, historically people who study diffusion only look at things that diffuse. Right? And this may seem obvious, why would you look at things that don't diffuse? Why would you study uninteresting things? Uh, why would you, but uh, of course this, this uh, 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 causes a big problem with the data that you're, uh, that you're uh, evaluating because you're selecting on the dependent variable. If you, if you only study successful things and you don't study unsuccessful things, then how can you show, how can you uh, predict uh, you know, what uh, causes people to be successful? 
The same is true for, for um, I mean, this of course is a message that is lost upon all writers of business books in airports. Um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a problem anyway. Um, so if we really want to understand the mechanisms by which things spread, we need data that satisfies two criteria. One is that it has to be at the individual level. We have to be able to see a thing spreading from one person to another person over many uh, such spreading events. Uh, and secondly, we want to, in some sense, have a complete census of all the things that are trying to spread. And this is complicated, but uh, we can get closer to that. So of course, you know, this is an area in which the web has been very helpful and there's a, now a sort of growing literature of work mostly in computer science that is exploiting these different sources of, of digital data. Um, and so we can start to ask new questions like, well, how much diffusion is actually viral anyway? What do we mean by viral? Can we sort of be more precise about what a viral thing is? Um, and, uh, and can we predict it? I actually won't answer that question uh, today. Um, so, um, okay, so I'll talk about a couple of papers. Uh, the first was a paper with uh, Sherrod Goyle and Dan Goldstein back at Yahoo Research. Uh, and, uh, you know, back then it was sort of early days uh, uh, in terms of the data that was available, and we were really scrounging around to get uh, anything that we could get our hands on. And so we, uh, what we did was, was really reuse data from six projects that we had worked on or that even our colleagues had worked on at Yahoo Research. Uh, and these were very diverse projects. We had a, a Facebook app that we had been using to study political attitudes. Uh, uh, Dan had run an experiment, a psychology experiment, uh, which uh, uh, several years earlier uh, that was conducted online. Uh, we worked with uh, some of our colleagues in the philanthropy group at Yahoo to uh, to do a, a sort of pay it forward uh, uh, giving campaign around the around the holiday season. Uh, some <coughs> colleagues of ours had built a, a, a synchronous video viewing app. Um, there was a premium uh, instant uh, messaging uh, 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 app that Yahoo had released. So there's a bunch of different projects and some Twitter data. Um, you know, this is, of course, this before the deluge of everything on Twitter um, studies. Um, but uh, so the, the point here, I, and I, I, again, I'm skipping over details, the point is actually that these studies were, were, these data sets were very diverse, right? So every one of them is biased in particular ways, the, the sort of network, the population, the, the, the engagement mechanism, the diffusion mechanism, all of these uh, were very sort of specific to the particular domain that we were studying. And so if you just looked at one of them, whatever conclusions that you reach could obviously be biased by any of those, uh, any of those uh, factors. So the, the claim here is that if we see similar patterns across all of these domains that have very different biases, then there's, there's some robustness to the, uh, to the patterns. And in fact, we see tremendous consistency across these six domains. So each one of these little rows here shows you the five most common uh, structural uh, motifs that we see. Uh, and so let's just look at Twitter for a second because everyone is familiar with Twitter. So what this little dot here means that 93% of the time somebody introduces, in this case, a shortened URL, uh, back then it was a bit.ly URL, into Twitter pointing to some content on the web and nobody pays attention, right? <laughs> so if you have that feeling sometimes, then you're not alone. Uh, most people have the same experience. 5% of the time, one of your followers retweets your tweet uh, this shows you that 0.9% of the time, two of your followers retweet, 0.3% of the time, three of them retweet it, and 0.3% of the time, one of your followers retweets it, and then one of their followers who's not one of your followers retweets them. So this is starting to look a little bit like contagion, right? Uh, so uh, notice that, that these numbers add up to about 99%. So 99% of everything that happens on Twitter looks like one of these very simple, uh, not very viral looking uh, motifs. And you see that pattern play out across all of these different uh, uh, domains. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, you, know, you, have, you have six domains and, and five uh, potential motifs associated with each of them. So there's 30 potential structures that you might see. 
and we only see seven, which is these five and this one and this one. So there's, and even the numbers look pretty similar. So there's, there's tremendous consistency and in fact you can aggregate up another level and say let's put all the data together uh, and we can make the following claim that, that across all of these domains about 90% uh, of the time uh, nothing happens, there is no subsequent adoptions. About 8% of the time uh, each, uh, each introduced item uh, gets one additional adoption. 1% of the time it gets two adoptions and 1% of the time is everything else, right? So everything you've ever heard of, every viral phenomenon, cat video, uh, et cetera, is in this little blue bar here on the right. Um, uh, and you might say, well, you know, that's interesting, but, um, but, you know, some of those things are extremely large, right? So, you know, the Spanish flu, which uh, happened about 100 years ago now, uh, uh, was a very rare event, you know, it was one in, you know, probably tens of thousands of flu epidemics uh, that have happened throughout history, but it infected a billion people, right, you know, roughly a third of the Earth's population, so it would be silly to sort of ignore that and say, well, that's a rare event, we don't care about that, because it actually occupies, if you think about the total number of flu cases uh, throughout history, quite a few of them were in that one event. So. So when we have these very, very skewed distributions of events, we, we, we care about these rare events. But what we can say here is something stronger, which is not only our most events small, but if we count up all the adoptions, uh, almost all of them happen within one hop of the sea, right? So very 99%, so only 1% of adoptions are more than one degree from the uh, originating node, and so only 1% of adoptions could sort of plausibly be called viral. So that's a, a much stronger statement than just that big events are rare. But of course you're saying, well, you know, I'm still not convinced because I know about this thing that, uh, uh, you, does anybody not know what this thing is? <laughs> um, I have found one person uh, who does not know about Gangnam Style. Um, uh, but, um, uh, so this, this, uh, this video has been viewed a couple of billion times. Uh, Google had to add a new digit to its, uh, to its counter on YouTube uh, because it broke. Um, uh, so we know that these big things happen. We know that, that, that you know, there are sometimes events that, that capture some sort of spirit and, and spread wildly and, and many people see them. Um, what we don't know is whether they're really viral, right? Because we also know that the Super Bowl is popular. You know, 100 million people watch the Super Bowl every year, but nobody would say the Super Bowl is a viral phenomenon, right? It's a broadcast phenomenon. Uh, and so if we go back to our Twitter data from this earlier study, we can see that some of the biggest events look pretty broadcasty, right? So this is a single node in the middle, and then you get a lot of people at degree one retweeting, and then very little else happening, right? Which is a very different kind of structure from this mental model that we have of things spreading over many generations. And so it's possible that that's what's going on with Gangnam Style. And we know, for example, that Gangnam Style was featured on the front page of Yahoo. Uh, and, you know, 100 million people come to the front page of Yahoo every day. And so it's possible that a lot of those views were not really viral at all, but were driven by sort of traditional broadcast media. So how would we answer this question? Um, well, one way to do it is just to collect a lot more data. Uh, and so this is what we did, uh, again, with Sherrod Goyle, but this time also with Ashton Anderson and Jake Hoffman uh, at Microsoft Research. Uh, and we took uh, a year's worth of, uh, of URLs from Twitter. Uh, so this is, roughly speaking, every video, every news story, every image, and every petition posted to Twitter over a 12-month period. So, so now this is, instead of 40 million URLs, we've got about over a billion URLs. Um, and then we tried to address an, another criticism that people had had of our earlier paper, which is that we just hadn't looked at interesting stuff. Right? And you might think, well, that's reasonable because a lot of stuff that people post to Twitter, maybe it's not meant to be spread. Maybe there's no intent to spread, right? So it's not really fair to count everything that gets posted to Twitter as, 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 as something that's trying to spread. And so to alleviate that concern, we restricted uh, this initial 1.4 billion observations, only to URLs that got retweeted at least 100 times, okay? 
So this is way more popular than anything that I showed you on the previous slide. In fact, these are very, very rare events. These happen only like one in 3,000 uh, posts on Twitter gets 100 retweets. Um, so you may never have had a post that gets 100 retweets on Twitter. Um, uh, and so, uh, so we, we are in, in that way, we reduce our initial population of over a billion to about 350,000. So we're a massive reduction in the amount of data that we have, but still uh, a lot of, of uh, observations of these, of these rare events. And so this is kind of, you know, kind of an interesting application of the big data principle that if you're studying rare events, uh, it helps to have a very large population of events to start with. So uh, now that we have this, um, this population of popular things, uh, we can measure this property that we call structural virality, which is a little bit different from the, the normal notion of virality, which usually refers to some sort of parameter in a model that's telling you about how infectious or how, how likely something is to get uh, spread at each stage. Uh, this really is a way of quantifying the structure. So imagine that something is introduced, it gets retweeted a bunch of times, and it's sort of, as it does so, it's lighting up some path, uh, some, some tree-like structure in the network. <laughs> Uh, and then when it's done uh, and all the retweeting has stopped, this, this structure is left over, uh, like a sort of fossil or something. Uh, and now we can uh, treat that structure as a network and we can measure properties of it. And, and by definition, these, these are all uh, acyclic branching networks. Uh, and so we can compute various properties of them and a, a lot of them turn out to be equivalent. But the one that we're going to focus on here is just a very simple one which is to compute the average shortest path length. So you know, pick every pair of nodes, compute the path length between them. If it's a broadcast, uh, like this structure here, then that number is going to be very close to two because everything except the central hub is two degrees of separation from everything else. Uh, and so that average asymptotically approach two as the broadcasts become large. And then when we uh, look at something that's very viral in this sense of multi-generational branching process, then the uh, average shortest path length is going to be proportional to the depth of the tree, which is, uh, which is uh, um, uh, uh, proportional to log n. So this, you get for every one of these uh, cascades, you get a number that's somewhere between 2 and log of n. Uh, and then you can compute that for every one of these 350,000 events, and you can ask questions about that distribution. So we're going to ask a couple of questions. First of all, what kind of diversity do we see? Uh, when, we, uh, when we look at all these different structures. Is there some sort of optimal spreading structure, right? If you sort of think about popular things, do they tend to be very viral do they, in, this, in this structural sense? Do they tend to be very broadcasty? You could you know, make up a story which would convince you of either direction, right? Or maybe it's some sort of optimal combination of the two, right? That there's some sort of, you know, a few broadcasts and then a lot of viral or a little bit of viral and a lot of broadcasts, right, that, that is, is sort of uh, uh, generates uh, the, 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 the most spreading. And then the second question we can ask is how does this relationship change as things become more popular? So is there some sort of relationship between popularity and, and virality? So here's the, you know, whatever you were guessing uh, in your head, I should have asked you to write something down. Anyway, the, 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 the result is that whatever you guessed, you're right. Um, <laughs> that uh, we see basically everything, right? There is tremendous diversity. It's like a sort of zoo of, uh, of structures uh, out there uh, on Twitter. And what this is showing you is six examples of uh, cascades that are all about the same size, right? So they all have roughly the same popularity, but they have very different structures. So this one at the top left here, which is the most broadcasty, show this big black triangle is really a broadcast. It's just all the lines are printed on top of each other. So this is a single node here. It's, I think, CNN. This is some CNN story. And a bunch of people have retweeted, uh, who follow CNN, have retweeted that story. And then there's a few little dribbles uh, off the bottom here. But it's almost all the action is happening in that black triangle. And then you can see as you go from left to right and from top to bottom that the black triangle is becoming less and less dominant and you're seeing more and more of what looks like viral spreading. So this uh, is a, uh, a New York Times uh, obituary about uh, some French freedom fighter who uh, died a few years ago, who's lived into his 90s and had this incredible life. 
uh, and escaped from the Nazis three times and all sorts of and just amazing life story. But no one's ever heard of this guy. Like, just total nobody, but, you know, fascinating story. And so people were uh, retweeting this thing. Um, and so um, uh, very different structure, but same, roughly the same popularity. And then underneath these structures, you can see what, what we're showing here is the sort of the data that you would have had back in the old days when you only got to count things over time. And you can see that that data is relatively uninformative, right? That a lot of these uh, aggregate counts over time look very similar to each other. So this sort of structural, the structure underlying uh, is sort of completely obscured by the, the, both the time scale and the shape of the curve. Uh, so that's the first message, that diversity is, is really, uh, uh, you know, sort of hiding there under the hood. Um, but uh, the second message is a little bit less, uh, well, I don't know if interesting is the right word, but less fun. Uh, and so this is showing uh, now how structural diversity varies with popularity. And we've broken uh, this, these box plots down into... Uh, types of media, so we have petitions, news stories, pictures, and videos, uh, and the box plots show the, 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 um, the solid black line show the median, and the boxes are the inner quartile range, and the data, the, the dots show the full range of the data. So you can see from these long stringy things that, that, that that's where the diversity is, that for any given size you see examples of, uh, of cascades that are all over the place, um, from very broadcasty to very viral, but the typical uh, uh, cascade is fairly close to the broadcasty end. And more, uh, I think, interesting or, or, or less obvious is that that continues to be true even as these cascades get bigger and bigger. Right? So, and this is especially true for pictures and videos where there's essentially zero correlation uh, between size and structural virality. So what this means is that the size of the cascade is being driven by the size of the single largest broadcast in the cascade. So almost all the action has been driven by broadcast. And this is what we, at the time, called the Justin Bieber effect, because Justin Bieber was the most followed person on Twitter. Now it's Katy Perry, so I guess it's the Katy Perry effect. But, you know, these people have tens of millions. I don't know if Katy Perry has cracked 100 million yet, but she's sort of up there in the 80 million uh, range. So this is sort of Super Bowl-like numbers in terms of, of, of coverage. So these are effectively, um, you know, network broadcasters who just happen to be individual people. And when they retweet something, even if the retweet rate is extremely low, they get a lot of, of retweets. Um, uh, and so, um, and, and, you know, that's why I think uh, pictures and videos show such a low correlation because celebrities are almost... Celebrities completely dominate the, the, the list of most followed people on Twitter, and celebrities generally talk about themselves. And so they are, <laughs> they, they're, they're, you know, tweeting out pictures and videos. They're not really, you know, sort of delving into the details of, you know, healthcare policy. Um, um, so you see a little more correlation in news, uh, uh, but it's actually still quite, quite low. Uh, so th there's sort of uh, less of a broadcast effect in news. And petitions, I interestingly, just more structurally viral in general, but again, um, very little relationship between popularity and virality. So what do we learn from studying this type of data? Uh, I think, you know, sort of the high-level lesson is that, uh, is that it's, it's, it's uh, you know, we have many, many theoretical models and thousands of papers that have been written about how things diffuse and, you know, recently sort of imaginary diffusion processes spreading on imaginary networks. Uh, and it's really informative to actually go and look at some of this data um, because what it has taught us is that we're really sort of looking in the wrong part of the parameter space. It's not that the models are necessarily wrong. In fact, we can replicate many of these features from relatively simple uh, um, disease models. Um, but... Uh, a lot of the emphasis in the modern modeling literature has been around this, what's called the epidemic threshold, this sort of, this phase transition that happens as you go from uh, zero infectiousness, you pass some sort of critical uh, 
uh, uh, value of the parameter, and it, it, the, the disease goes from dying out to spreading exponentially. And if you're, a, if you're an epidemiologist, you want to keep things below this epidemic threshold, and if you're a marketer, you want to get it above the epidemic threshold, but everybody is concerned about the conditions under which uh, that, that, that govern that particular threshold. And what we're finding is that everything is well below that threshold, right? Nothing is spreading uh, virally in that sense. Uh, there's this sort of constant dying out process. And this, you know, actually, when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense that the world is just awash in people trying to get your attention all the time. And, you know, Twitter makes this completely evident. Uh, it's just overwhelming uh, how much stuff has been thrown at you. And so just the competition for attention forces everything down into this uh, sub-viral uh, regime. And the only thing that can sort of compete with that uh, stifling effect is, are these enormous hubs that, that can sort of push something uh, out and, and keep it propagating for a while longer before eventually it, it peters out. Um, uh, so uh, this, I, it, you know, for us is, is suggestive of, of, you know, new directions to take the modeling and, and if you're in the, the, the marketing world, uh, it's also something to be cognizant of. Uh, and finally, it's a, it's a, a, a I think, a really uh, relevant application of, of when the big part of big data actually matters. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, as you know, a lot of sort of, of, of hype around this, this label and lots of claims are made that turn out to be not very uh, um, uh, useful. Uh, but I think when you're studying rare events, uh, it, it really is necessary to have, you know, in, in the case of this last study, you know, a billion is not too many, right? It's about what you need to, to do this kind of study. And, and of course, if you, if you redid the study today, you would get that many uh, observations in a month because the, the um, uh, the, the, the rate of, of growth of, of social media sites like Twitter is, is, is so um, um, tremendous. Okay, so I want to, as I'm running out of time, uh, talk about uh, this other topic uh, of virtual labs. Uh, and, of, and, you know, of course, this is a, another very old uh, area and we have, um, you know, People have been doing lab experiments since probably the 1930s, and certainly in the 1960s there was a, a sort of golden age of you know studying organisations in labs, um, and and this is the, the kind of setup that that researchers would would rig up. Uh, and there's lots of advantages of doing that. Um, you get a lot of control. Uh, you can uh, identify cause and effect more easily. Uh, but there's lots and lots of, there's a long laundry list of disadvantages and I'm sure that you're familiar with all of them. Um, but basically, the consequence of those limitations is that it's very difficult to uh, generalize from the lab environment to uh, the real world. And this is a, an old criticism and it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's quite valid. Uh, so good for testing particular theories but, but very uh, problematic for uh, for figuring out how those theories should apply in the real world where inevitably lots of other things are going on. So one way to sort of view this uh, graphically is if you sort of imagine the, the sort of design space of experiments uh, along these three dimensions, each of which is probably multiple dimensions. Um, one is the scale, how many, how many people do you have uh, in your experiment? Another is the duration, how long does it run for? And the third is sort of this uh, realism, complexity of the experiment. And so the real world is kind of out here somewhere, large scale, long duration, high complexity. Uh, and, you know, the vast bulk of experiments that have ever been run in labs are sort of indistinguishable from the origin, right? Where you're like very small numbers, very short periods of time, typically less than an hour, uh, and very stylized, uh, simple uh, games that are being played. So the, the challenge here is, you know, can we use the web to, to sort of push out this red boundary and try to uh, get closer to the real world? And so I'll try to give three quick examples. The first one is, a, is an old one. This is work that done with Matt Selganik and Peter Dodds uh, right here at Columbia uh, over a decade ago. And we were interested in how social influence affects the dynamics of, uh, of uh, cultural market. So people make decisions about what they like, but those decisions are influenced by what they think other people like. How does that affect the dynamics of the market? So you have the micro level question of individual decision making, and then all those individual decisions are aggregating up to the macro level of 
uh, of distributions of success. And so we recruited, in this case, about 14,000 uh, participants who were shown a, a, a page that looked like this, where they had 48 songs by bands they hadn't heard of. Uh, and in some cases, they just saw the names of the bands and the songs. And in other cases, they were shown, they were randomly assigned to see how many times those songs had been downloaded by people ahead of them. So there's a like, weak social influence signal there. Uh, and what we were able to show uh, experimentally uh, is that when people know what other people like, popular songs become unpopular, uh, unpopular songs become, uh, sorry, popular songs become more popular, unpopular songs become less popular, so the distribution of success becomes more unequal, but at the same time, the, uh, the, the songs that become most popular become increasingly hard to predict. Uh, and we were able to show that by creating multiple copies of this world and, uh, and comparing uh, the distribution of, and the ranking of popularity uh, of, of songs across these different worlds. So, um, so this uh, uh, helps us to understand, uh, you know, what the mechanism is that's driving uh, unpredictability. Uh, but it also shows another uh, interesting phenomenon that, uh, that sort of blends the psychology and the economics uh, of markets where, you know, so economists are uh, focused on markets and they're revealing of preferences. The psychologists are much more interested in how markets, or in, in how uh, circumstances construct preferences. And what we find here is an example of where the market itself is not just revealing preferences, but is also constructing them at the same time. Uh, and so, uh, there's, in, in that sense, there's no way to get rid of this unpredictability. It's something that's baked into the dynamics of the aggregation process. So this was sort of scientifically a very interesting uh, uh, result for us, but uh, it also demonstrated uh, this important methodological point, which was that you can now, I mean, there's not that many undergraduates at Columbia. There's no way that we could have run this experiment uh, in a physical lab. And you have to have that many people to do this experiment, right? That each one of these worlds that we created had, um, uh, had uh, a couple of thousand people in it uh, and you needed that number because you had to uh, aggregate over so many individual level decisions. Okay. Uh, so the second dimension that I wanted to mention is this question of realism that, uh, you know, the Music Lab experiment was interesting in, uh, uh, in terms of scale and you can see new things by uh, simply jacking up N in the experiment, but, you know, it's a very simple, you know, you're clicking on a song and saying, I want to download this song. And, you know, that's sort of a fairly impoverished measure, even of, you know, popularity of music. It doesn't tell you very much about how groups of people do other things that we're more interested in. Uh, and so uh, this is a question we've been grappling with for years about how to study problem solving uh, in groups of people uh, where the problems are not completely trivial and artificial. Uh, so we're looking for, we were looking for a, a task that was sort of real enough that it looked like something that happened in the real world, but was simple enough that we could put it into a lab setting and actually, uh, um, you know, study it in a controlled environment. And so a few years ago, I met this guy, uh, Patrick Meyer, uh, who runs this organization called the Standby Task Force. And this was started in 2010 uh, during the Haiti earthquake, or right after the Haiti earthquake. Uh, and he was a graduate student at Harvard at the time, and he was sitting in his dorm room wondering what he could do. And he had this insight that, uh, you know, in the rubble of, of Port-au-Prince, uh, you know, where the relief agencies were having a tremendous amount of trouble figuring out how to allocate their resources, because there was no information about where people were or what their state was that there, there was actually a lot of information, but it was being produced in this noisy, unstructured way via social media. People were sort of tweeting things, they were posting things online. Uh, and so he got together a group of volunteers and he, uh, he sifted through this information and, and pulled out those sort of uh, instances where somebody had said something quite specific about their state or about some damage that had occurred. Uh, and he put it all on a map and that's what's called a crisis map. Uh, and so crisis mapping is now this thing, there's a whole community of people 
around the world who do crisis mapping and this standby task force has deployed a number of times over the years uh, in, in um, mostly in natural disasters but uh, also in, in the, um, during the Libya uh, crisis. Uh, and so this is something that the UN finds pretty helpful. So this is sort of a real world task that, that uh, has real world consequences. Uh, but it's a natively online activity. So this is like a bunch of people are recruited uh, on the fly. They are, you know, interacting via various web tools and they're creating a digital map. And that's the, uh, which, you know, has some, it can be evaluated for its accuracy. Uh, so this sounds like something we might do in a lab, right? And that's exactly what we did. Uh, and this is work here with uh, Andrew Mao, who just finished his postdoc at Microsoft Research, uh, who built this incredible app that I will show you. Um, let's see. And uh, also Winter Mason and Sid Suri from Facebook and Microsoft Research. Um, and so this is crisis mapping in a lab. And on the left-hand side, uh, you can see uh, all of these little boxes scrolling down, those are, those are real tweets uh, that were produced uh, by people in the Philippines uh, in December 2012 when uh, Typhoon Pablo rolled through uh, and caused a tremendous amount of damage. Uh, and this is data that we got from Patrick uh, at the Standby Task Force. This is real data that was really used in a real deployment by the Standby Task Force uh, back in 2012. Uh, and it's about 1,500 of these tweets, and most of them are not saying anything very uh, interesting. They were just talking about this typhoon or, uh, you know, or, or uh, you know, they're all in some sense or another about the typhoon, but they, they don't have any useful information. But a small minority of them are very specific uh, and mention or have pictures of, uh, you know, washed out roads or bridges, damaged houses, displaced people, uh, events that the UN uh, OCHA, the Office for Coordinating Humanitarian Affairs, is interested in. And so what these guys are doing, and this is uh, a bunch of people recruited off Amazon's Mechanical Turk, uh, they are doing exactly what the Standby Task Force was doing, which is trying to find those relevant tweets, uh, documenting them in this little spreadsheet here, geolocating them, which is tricky because many of them are not geotagged. Uh, so you have to do some sort of sleuthing to figure out where this village is that they're talking about. Um, and they're putting them on this map. Uh, and so once we have this map, we can, we can evaluate it uh, for accuracy. So we did this not once, but, but uh, dozens of times uh, uh, with different numbers of Turkas. Uh, and so the first kind of face validity question is, you know, can they do this? And it wasn't obvious to us that, that in one hour uh, a bunch of random people could even do this, right? Because when you start, I mean, it's, it's actually quite difficult. Um, but Turkas are amazingly good at just focusing on the task that you give them, and they take it very, very seriously. Um, and uh, they were able to produce maps that were surprisingly similar, and in some cases, as good as the map that was produced on the left here by the, by the standby task force um, over a period of 24 hours. Uh, so the question we were interested in is, how many people should you recruit? Like, what should be the group size? And there's you know, all kinds of conflicting theories about the relationship between group size and performance. So in one uh, set of theories, uh, individual performance goes down with group size because of free riding or as a psychologist call it social loafing. Uh, and in fact, we see that. Uh, we see that uh, effort is going down. Uh, individual effort is going down quite substantially uh, as a function of group size. The more people there are to do things, the less pressure you feel uh, to do them yourself. So maybe you should just you know, recruit a bunch of individual people and have them work on their own. Uh, but then they can't talk to each other, right? And then they can't help each other, and they can't correct each other's mistakes. And so you might think that, uh, that collaboration would help. Uh, and in fact, we also see that. So that as the group size increases, we increasingly see people working on the same events together and uh, checking each other's work and updating it and making suggestions and deciding that they, oh, you know, that event that you're reporting is actually the same thing that I'm working on. Uh, we should merge these two reports uh, because it's redundant. And so there's a lot of that kind of activity going on. And what we see here is this trade-off between the two and this blue line here where uh, the performance, the accuracy of, uh, of these maps uh, is, um, 
uh, at first, the, 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 these are, this blue line represents what we call synthetic teams, where you take individual maps and you combine them. So this is sort of giving the individuals the best chance at competing with actual groups. And you can see that the blue line is uh, at least as good as these black dots, which is the, the raw data, uh, up until about uh, groups of size eight. And then uh, the inability of uh, individuals to talk to each other and to correct each other's errors uh, outweighs the slacking off effect. Uh, and the larger groups actually do better. And in fact, uh, the largest groups do about as well as this red line here, which is the real performance of the standby task force. So, um, so the, the message is that collaboration, in this case at least, trumps uh, uh, free riding uh, with uh, increasing group size. So finally, um, uh, I want to talk about duration. And um, here we're going to study a, a classical game. This is no attempt to be realistic here. This is, this is a, a game that has been studied many, many, many times uh, in, in lab environments, this finitely repeated prisoner's dilemma. And so the basic uh, unit of the game is two people playing a 10-round game of, of uh, prisoner's dilemma with this payoff matrix. And what we see here is the same thing that people have seen for decades, which is that uh, individuals start off cooperating, and then as they get to the end of the game, one of them tries to take advantage of the other by defecting, and then the other one retaliates, and then we end up in mutual defection for the rest of the game. So the question that we're interested in is what happens if they play this game again? You assign them to a new partner, and they play the game again, and then you assign them to a new partner, and they play the game again, and they just play and play and play and play. Uh, what will happen? Uh, and one theory that was advanced by Krebs uh, back in 1980 uh, is this notion of, of um, rational altruism, that the, really the players are rational, but they think that other people might not be rational, and so they think, uh, you know, if you're going to cooperate, I should co it's in my interest to cooperate. But if you start running into people who are just like you, right, and they take advantage of you, then, you know, if somebody defects on you in round eight, then the next game you're going to be smart and you're going to defect in round eight. But if you run into somebody who wasn't going to defect in round eight, now they become disillusioned and they start defecting in round eight. And then people start defecting in round seven and then people start defecting in round six and you see this kind of unraveling, uh, well the theory is that you will see this unraveling uh, and eventually if you play this thing for long enough, you'll end up back at the Nash equilibrium where nobody is, def is, is cooperating at all. So people have tried to, to, to study this unraveling behavior in lab experiments. And the most recent uh, case is um, Matt Embry and colleagues at NYU uh, did a very careful study a few years ago. Um, and they ran about 20 experiments over the course of an hour and they saw the unraveling begin. Uh, and so they hypothesized that this will continue and eventually cooperation will uh, be extinguished, but it will take a long time, and it's far too long to sit around and study in a physical lab. So this is, of course, perfect for us. We want to try to do this uh, online. Uh, and so we did essentially exactly the same experiment as Embry et al. And, and others before them, uh, except that instead of running it for a single hour, we brought the same people, the same 100 Turkers, roughly 100 uh, Turkers, back every day for 20 consecutive weekdays over the course of a month. And so what that looks like is this is one game and then we randomly reassign people and they play 20 games. So that's what one session looks like and that's what 20 sessions look like. So there's 4,000 rounds of Prisoner's Dilemma there. You might think, who can play 4,000 rounds of Prisoner's Dilemma? <laughs> so boring. Um, once again, like, Turkers are amazing. Like, they, <laughs> they really, I mean, and, and, and this is, a, I mean, by the way, I mean, this is true of, of prisoner's dilemma experiments in general, that people get really into this, you know, and they get very personal about it, and they get really upset when other people, there's one guy who, like, obviously took, like, the first semester of economics of microecon uh, and, and learned that, like, the Nash equilibrium was to defect on all rounds, but didn't take the second semester where you learned that nobody actually plays like that. <laughs> and he played defect, all defects the entire month. <laughs> and everyone hated this guy. 
I mean, they all wrote about it, like, there's one jerk, he won't... Yeah. Uh, so they really get very into this, uh, and he did very badly, by the way. It's a terrible strategy. You never do that. Um, um, so what did we learn? Well, really, uh, uh, not what we expected. Right? We, we were very convinced that this unraveling would happen, and we, that's what we were hypothesizing. Um, and we had all kinds of ideas for what to do after cooperation had completely unraveled. Uh, and for the, the first seven days, that's what it looked like was happening. That, that things were, were uh, uh, this is the last round, this is the second last round, this is round eight, and then round one. And you can see that, that cooperation is declining quite precipitously uh, in these latest rounds. But after about seven days, it stops. And it just sort of sits there for the rest of the experiment. And we kept waiting and waiting and waiting. And eventually, we played this thing for a whole month, and it never, it never went down. Uh, so then we were puzzled what was going on and we looked very carefully at the strategies that all of these people were playing and we found that there were roughly two groups of people. There's sort of a, about 60% of them were playing like the Krebs uh, paper suggested. They were, they were rational altruists. They were you know, forming um, uh, a, 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 a hypothesis about the distribution of types in the population and they were roughly playing some sort of best response uh, uh, to, to that distribution of types. And as a result, they were starting to unravel. And so T9 means that I, I uh, cooperate until round nine, and then I defect on round nine. T8 means I defect on round eight. Uh, and so you can see that everyone's sort of starting off cooperating the whole way, and then they're kind of gradually uh, unraveling. But this second group of about 40% of the people at the top uh, don't do that. They just don't. They don't do anything. They just they say, I'm going to cooperate unless someone defects on me. And they just play that. They don't update. It's like you, they don't learn. They, they, they get annoyed. Uh, and they report this uh, in, the, in the exit surveys. But for various reasons, they, they don't unravel. Uh, and so we call these people resilient cooperators. Uh, and so that has two effects. First of all, they, they boost cooperation. But the other more interesting effect is they, they stop the unraveling because the unravelers, the rational people, are, are roughly trying to balance, uh, you know, they, 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 they learn that about 40% of the population are not going to defect unless they do. Uh, and so they get to a, a, a point of the unraveling where it's better for them to not unravel any further. And so uh, these resilient cooperators are able to uh, to uh, keep cooperation pretty stable uh, throughout the entire experiment. And interestingly, they pay a price for this, right? So their payoff, their average payoff, is significantly lower than the people who are not resilient cooperators. But they are willing to do this, uh, either out of principle or sort of enlightened uh, long-term self-interest, where they think, well, if we start, and, and they actually would say this. I mean, it's very interesting that people, they've clearly thought about what their strategies are, and, and some of them would say, well, you know, if, if I start unraveling, then everyone else will start doing it, and then we'll all be worse off, which is true. Uh, and, and so they're, they're happy, well, not happy, but they're, they're, they're willing to pay this penalty in order to benefit the collective. So a fascinating result that just could not have seen if you couldn't run the experiment. You had to run the experiment for many days to even see this behavior. It's just, you know, uh, it's um, so a novel result that, that, uh, that illustrates the, the benefit of, of, of running things for a long time. So <laughs> lots, of, right. lots of interesting things. Thank you. Thank you. Well, a few questions, that's okay. We have a mic down there. Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks very much, Duncan. I thought, I was watching this, the fir the, for those of us who are academics, we want, want people to pay attention to us. I think the first, he started off, it was quite a depressing, right? Nobody really cares about what we do. Nobody reads it. But the end part was really good. That is to say, we have pro-social people in the economy that are going to save us. And I hope all of you guys are obviously very pro-social and help save the world. So what I'll do is maybe we'll open up for a few questions for Duncan. Anybody have questions? Yeah. And what, you can actually feel the, the questions. Sure. Talking. Yes, thank you. So I'm just wondering who the resilient cooperators are. Are they men? Are they women? Are they young? Are they old? Uh, good question. Not, not they, they don't 
fall into any obvious demographic category. They're not, they're not uh, predominantly male or female or, or um, and age is trickier because it's all self-declared, but, but yeah, we don't, we don't see any obvious pattern. Yeah. Um, that they, they have different motivations for being, for being how they are. Some of them are, are, um, seem altruistic. They, they seem to have pro-social uh, motivations. They care about other people's payoffs. Others seem to be responding to norms, so they, they would sort of say, well, that's the right thing to do, and, and some of them would even say, well, I tried defecting, but then I felt guilty, and so I went back to cooperating. Um, uh, and, you know, others seem to have this kind of enlightened self-interest uh, um, uh, perspective of this is something, you know, this is actually good for me in a certain way, so I'm going to keep doing it. Um, so, you know, our experiment wasn't designed to try to identify between these different strategies, but I think, you know, in future work that would be really, would be interesting to see if we could connect uh, this sort of behavior to, uh, you know, other attributes, whether psych uh, psychometric or, or demographic or, or even sort of uh, how people play other types of games. Right. Yes. Continuing to cooperate, yeah. Whether or not this cooperation would then decay more rapidly, uh, I, I suspect the answer is yes, it would. Uh, and and our in our original design, we we wanted to uh, split the population and have uh, two different sets of payoffs. One which was relatively favorable to cooperation, which was this set of payoffs, and another which was uh, relatively challenging to cooperation. Um, but we were, we, were so, um, we were so concerned about attrition in the experiment because we'd never run an experiment using Turkas for more than an hour. And so we were so concerned that over the course of a month we'd lose too many people. Uh, and so we, we decided to just pick one set of parameters and, um, and, and, and use all of our, you know, all of our population. Uh, but then we got very little attrition, and so in retrospect, we could have done, uh, we could have, we could have looked at the two sets of payoffs. And uh, I think in my my guess is that you would see, you would definitely see more unraveling, um, but uh, but not total unraveling, right? That 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 um, uh, that at least this is our hypothesis that that these resilient cooperators are really a type, and you would probably peel some of them off uh, if you made it more costly for them, um, but, uh, uh, but there would still be sort of some fraction of the population that would be behaving that way and they would still have the same kind of anchoring effect. So anyway, we, have a, we, we did some modeling, uh, some simulation modeling, uh, which uh, has generated the new hypothesis about what we should expect as we vary the fraction of, um, of resilient cooperators and that would be, um, I think, you know, a fascinating follow-up experiment to do, but we haven't done it. Thanks. So, so I would be interested in in your take on um, how, like, the interaction of natural agents such as the Turkers yeah. with artificial agents such as bots would basically influence this, right? So, you know, I, I guess, like, in, in, you know, we see more and more of these interactions, and I would also think that so this justification of, you know. Basically, I want to cooperate because I want to induce other people to cooperate. Might sort of break down if I know that a part of them I know are sort of bots mm -hmm. that will always defect, for example. Yep. And so sort of like just stepping back from the specific question, do you have like a take on? Because I'm sort of like thinking more and more about things where, um, you know, specific things and organizations and institutions, we sort of like rely more and more on artificial intelligence mm. to. Uh, you know, solve tasks that typically were done by humans. And so the interaction between, like, you know, natural agents mm -hmm. and these, like, artificial agents might yeah. sort of, and, and, yeah. Yeah, so I, I would say two things about that. One is, you know, in some earlier work, we did actually uh, introduce bots into a networked version of a public goods game. <coughs> and uh, sure enough, uh, you know, when you have very cooperative bots, they 
have a small positive effect on their partners. Uh, when you have an, an uncooperative bot, uh, it has a much larger negative effect on, so it's an asymmetry between, uh, between um, uh, positive and negative. In that case, uh, the people didn't know they were playing with bots, right? So they were they they just assumed that everyone was a was a human. Uh, so you you can you know so the first answer is you you, you can certainly it seems you certainly can tweak uh, cooperation levels to some extent by inserting uh, you know cooperative or uncooperative um, bots into the mix. But then the second question, which we haven't looked at, is how that is. Uh, moderated by uh, knowing that they're bots, right? And, and I, but I think Sultan and Stocker looked at this back in the 80s and uh, didn't find, uh, in some, I think uh, people are sort of less offended by a bot defecting than by a human defecting. Um, <laughs> So, that, I mean, I'm sure there's some very interesting psychology here, which I don't think has been worked out yet. But, um, uh, but uh, so that, that would be a, uh, you know, I think that that's a really important, uh, you know, modifying effect is whether or not people know that they're bots and whether that makes them, you know, uh, you know, you know, maybe they don't like that because they don't like playing with bots or they don't like the fact that the bot can't be persuaded. Uh, or maybe they think it's okay because it's just a machine and so it, you, they don't take it personally. Um, and you could imagine all of these things are possible. And I think, you know, again, this is an example where these virtual lab experiments, in theory at least, have some advantages that you really want to test a lot of different variations. Um, and so the sort of ability to run experiments quickly and relatively costlessly, uh, or not costlessly, but cheaply, uh, should should um, uh, help us do that. So what the beliefs are that they have about the population? So um, uh, do they know how many people are involved? So how many it was how many people they are playing? And is this a perfect stranger matching? So that I know I will only play once with the same person? So. Uh, it, it is perfect strangers. There's no, there's no identifiers. You don't, you, no one is labeled, right? So you don't know that you've played this particular person before uh, and you don't know anything about their reputation. So there's no reputation uh, and there's no memory. I mean, so, there's no But then, then, then it's, so if there are no labels and so on, so, so do they explicitly know it's a stranger matching? So I will only play with you once? And do they know how large is the population? No, so so they, 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 they we don't tell them how much, how big the population is, but you can, oh, they can, they could figure it out. If they were really thinking about it, they would, they would know roughly how many people were involved, and they would probably assume that they were the same people, and they could, they could then assume that they would encounter the same person uh, repeatedly. Um, but let's see. So they, there was two groups of fifty, and you're playing twenty games per day, so you might expect to encounter the same person roughly every three days, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that it's, it, it's, it's conceivable that that uh, uh, knowledge, uh, you know, further encouraged them to behave cooperatively, yes, but of course exactly. you never yes. know when you're actually oh, playing that person again, so. Yes. Uh, so but you can control for that, if you would make explicit that it's a stranger matching, so you will just play with a person once, that will be interesting. You, you could, you could uh, yes, you could do that if you that had might a, break down a larger early. population, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. I think in particular, uh, Duncan just had a baby boy last week. So in addition to thank you for this talk, let's also congratulate him on the new addition to his family. Thank you. Thank you.